Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, decoding the latest guidance about when to roll up your sleep. mRNA vaccines are the preferred vaccine. The question that people ought to ask themselves is, what is my own risk of getting COVID in the next two to three weeks? We will untangle the message to determine what it means where you live and how you can weigh the risks. Also tonight, his fight for a pension denied because of an outdated definition of spouse. Your description of a couple was a man and a woman. His husband died thinking his CN pension would provide, but the checks never came. It would have broke his heart. Why his last stand could turn the tide. Plus. We are so excited to reopen the KFC here. Why the return of one fast food joint to Yellowknife means a lot more than just a bucket of chicken. This is The National. It is a surge in numbers Canadians can finally feel good about. Vaccine supply ramping up this month to new highs. And for millions more Canadians, that means it's finally their turn to get the shot, with many provinces expanding eligibility today. Canada is expecting 2 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech this week and every week in May, nearly double what it's been getting since mid-March. And while most doctors have been urging Canadians to get the first shot available to them, today a more nuanced message in guidance about who should get the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Tonight, we'll go through that recommendation, what it could mean for you and why it has some doctors so concerned. Some say today's advice from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization will leave Canadians confused about what shot to get. And at a crucial point in the pandemic, Christine Birak walks us through the recommendation and the controversy it's stirring. It's a single shot, and everyone agrees it can protect people against severe disease and death from COVID-19. But Johnson & Johnson, much like AstraZeneca, is not being recommended for Canadians under 30. As for everyone else... They need to make an informed choice as to whether they would prefer to get vaccinated um, sooner with a Janssen or AstraZeneca vaccine or wait to receive the mRNA vaccine. Both vaccines carry a risk of less than 1% of causing a rare type of blood clot. So far, that's about one case in every 100,000 people vaccinated with AstraZeneca and up to one in half a million for Johnson & Johnson. With mRNA vaccines, the number is even smaller. So how do you figure out whether you should wait for Pfizer or Moderna? If I'm working from home, I don't see anyone, you know, can I wait two to three weeks? If I'm in the middle of a hot spot where transmission is happening le right, left and center, where my ICUs are overflowing, then I think it's easy to say my, the, my, the best vaccine for me is the one I'm able to get now. The issue has sparked a firestorm on social media. While some doctors see it as a consistent, measured approach, others say Nassi's advice offers Canadians confusion and anxiety, even arguing it's troubling from a health equity perspective to bake in a hierarchy to the vaccines. I think it just gets harder and harder to... Uh, expect that Canadians are going to line up for these. Of course, less risk is best, but doctors say in the midst of a third wave, asking people to choose is a daunting calculation. Some people will, because some people are perfectly accepting of the risks, and the risks are very minuscule, uh, but others won't, and they'll wait. And so that's going to delay vaccination for a proportion of the population. Doctors on NACI's panel insist anyone who got the AstraZeneca shot three to four weeks ago is no longer at risk of rare blood clots, adding they just want Canadians to be aware of the issue in order to make informed decisions for themselves. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so this is a story that begs for some bottom line clarity. Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Zane Chagla joining us. So this notion uh, of a preferred vaccine holding out for a better shot who should and who shouldn't listen to that advice? Yeah, so, so NASI has to skirt the line here. There's a difference in the recommendation they make to a place like PEI than in the heart of Mississauga or in the heart of Calgary. You know, the, the risk-benefit ratio of the vaccine, you know, 1 in 50,000 to 100,000 getting this reaction. Well, in, in Mississauga, the, the chance of you running into someone with COVID is much higher, and the chance of your complications, hospitalization, and death are much higher. So... 
you know, right now, people in hotspots need to get the first vaccine they can. Healthcare is stressed, and you don't want to be that statistic that ends up in the hospital or dying. Can I ask you quickly, um, how should folks who've gotten the AstraZeneca vaccine feel right now about that choice to get that? Yeah, yeah they should feel good. I mean, the data from the UK suggests they're, they're 60 to 80 percent protected against symptomatic COVID-19 protected against transmitting COVID-19, protected in hospital, protected against death. And so, you know, they're protected. They can wait the 90 days to get their second dose until more information comes available. But they made a good decision for themselves, their family, and their friends. Dr. Chagla, thanks for this. No problem. In Alberta, like many other places in Canada, people appear divided on the pandemic. But amid protests, debates, denials, and accusations, the virus is relentless. This is Alberta's rolling average of new COVID cases per day. The danger clear enough four weeks ago that the province returned to step one restrictions, closing indoor dining and reducing retail to 15% capacity. The impact so far on case rates, they've almost doubled. It's too early to say if targeted restrictions introduced last week will work any better. No other province has seen infection numbers like this. And as Carolyn Dunn shows us, while criticism and outrage rises with those numbers, the Premier tonight signaled he is ready to do more. Two Albertas, one group defending a pastor who defied public health rules for months, another drawing stars in chalk, paying tribute to each of the more than 2,000 Albertans who have died from COVID-19. And they die alone and they die intubated and that's trauma. Despite the highest active caseload in Canada, there's little consensus on what to do about it. I think they're a bit overreaching. I really don't think there is a need for going as far as we're going with the lockdowns and all that. I think it's better to have a real hard, painful May than a sad, really depressing July. In hot spots, junior high and high schools are online, gyms are closed. Across the province, retail is capped and restaurants are limited to takeout or patio only. It can be a challenge for sure in, in this entire past year and a bit. We've just had the mentality from the beginning of rolling with the punches, but they are sincere punches. Chris Armstrong and her partner wish government would crack down. The current enforcement is, um, to put it lightly, a bit of a joke. A weekend rodeo with hundreds went ahead despite warnings from officials. That seemed to be too much for the Premier today. Apparently they don't care uh, or are somehow choosing to ignore the hundreds of their fellow Albertans in hospital and intensive care beds right now battling this disease and in some cases fighting for their lives. Furious public health experts pointed the finger back at Kenny. There has been utter hypocrisy um, in in actually role modeling these public health regulations. Some of the government's own MLAs have publicly disagreed with COVID health measures. With pressure mounting and cases spiking, Jason Kenney says tomorrow, new restrictions are coming. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Nova Scotia is also dealing with an unprecedented surge of COVID cases. And for those who fail to take restrictions seriously, the Premier had something to get off his chest. Over the weekend, there were 37 fines issued in the Halifax area. That's outrageous. I have a serious question. What is wrong with you? We are in the third wave of a deadly pandemic. And the selfish few don't care. Healthcare professionals are working nearly around the clock keep us safe and the selfish few don't care. Last week Nova Scotia closed schools, indoor dining, many stores and heavily restricted gatherings. Newly reported cases though have surged to more than 100 a day. A local state of emergency has been declared in Iqaluit as Nunavut's capital struggles with the COVID-19 outbreak. The city reported eight new cases today, bringing Nunavut's active case count to 85. 81 of those cases are in Iqaluit. The territory's capital has been on lockdown since April the 15th. The state of emergency will give city bylaw officers the power to enforce lockdown rules. And parents in Yellowknife scrambled today as all schools there and in two nearby communities have been ordered closed. The order came after eight cases of COVID-19 were confirmed 
at an elementary school over the weekend. 12 other probable cases have also been connected to that cluster. Most of those infected are said to be children. A mandatory indoor mask order was also put into place in the city. Well, a growing number of Canadians are criticizing the government's at-home COVID-19 testing program for returning travelers. Endless waits, missing tests, and some even stuck in quarantine for days beyond their mandated two weeks. Here's Magda Gabrasalase on what's wrong and what's being done about it. This balcony is as far as Montreal's Mohamed Valji could go for 18 days after returning from work in the U.S. I'm in this sort of weird limbo where I don't know how long this could take. A form of extended quarantine, he says, because the company in charge of mandatory quarantine tests lost his. On social media, he's not alone. There are other complaints reported to the company about their at-home test kits, like waiting hours to do the COVID test on video chat with a nurse, having the wrong serial number and long delays in getting the results. That really sucks. It feels like we fulfilled a part of the agreement, but Switch Health and the Government of Canada did not. And that's unfair. Ottawa gave Switch Health nearly $100 million to do this testing for travelers at some major airports and all land crossings. Now this doctor worries frustration may lead to recklessness. You know, that's problematic because, you know, first of all, a person may be infected and, you know, may decide not to follow through with the testing and may go out and infect other people. The CEO of Switch Health tells us the system is working. We have caught over 6,000 positive cases and probably over 1,500 variants of concern. But he admits there have been some problems. It's why the government requires the second test to be done on day 8 now instead of day 10. People are now being given specific appointment times to do the test with a nurse and at-home tests will be picked up on weekends too. So your actual observed specimen collection goes very quickly and smoothly. In Montreal, Valji says that doesn't address what happened to him. But today he found out he's finally free to go. We sort of celebrated because we didn't know when it was going to be over, but it's definitely over. And he has the test results to prove it. Mark de Gebrasalas, CBC News, Toronto. There is anger tonight among Ontario families who lost loved ones in long-term care homes during the pandemic. They say the minister in charge failed to do her job today in the face of a damning report. Here's Ellen Morrow. Ontario's long-term care minister took questions from just three journalists on the scathing final report, more than 300 pages long, offering no apology after more than 3,700 deaths and the commission's finding that delays in government action were catalysts of the crisis. I think collectively as a society, we need to do some soul searching. and understand. Minutes later, Mary Lee Fullerton abruptly walked away. Minister, can you stay a little longer? There are more reporters on Fullerton's press conference scheduled just half an hour before she was due in the legislature. She failed. Will she do the right thing and resign? Transparency and accountability are key. But there's been no accountability, says this grieving granddaughter. Running off stage, you know, when people are still, still have questions, that's just not how a leader you know, should act. Doris Way's grandmother died in December in the second wave that killed even more residents. The lessons of the first wave, the report said, not heeded quickly enough by the province. Part of our anger is because you're not, you're not owning up to what happened. The apology would have been everything. Fullerton says inspections of homes will now be improved. Ontario is also promising increased staffing to provide more direct care. But the commission says the province is not acting fast enough. I have zero faith. Maureen McDermott's mother is in her final days. McDermott, too, wants an apology for the trauma of the past year. It feels like just a perpetual motion of grief confusion, so much anger, so much anger. And for the province, so much loss. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto.
A longtime junior hockey coach is in custody tonight facing charges of assault and sexual assault. It comes after a CBC News investigation exposed troubling allegations about the coach's behavior. Senior investigative reporter Jonathan Gatehouse has the exclusive details. You're skilled elite hockey players. Get your hands out of your ass. On the ice, Bernie Lynch was known for his aggressive coaching style, but his complaints about his off-ice behavior that have led to his arrest. CBC News has learned Lynch has been charged with sexual assault and assault, relating to an allegation that dates back to 1988, when he was coaching in Regina. The complainant, a player, was 17 at the time. He came forward to police following a recent CBC News investigation that chronicled a troubling list of complaints from players and parents about Lynch's behavior over decades. It, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing news that, I mean, I, I, don't, I almost don't have words. This woman's son, a player for the Fort Francis Lakers last year, spoke to CBC News in March. Her son received dozens of unwanted texts and emails from Lynch, who was then coaching in the Ontario town. Some texts pleaded with the young player to spend time with him. CBC is not revealing this parent's identity to protect her son's privacy. I can't imagine how many lives he, um, he disrupted along the way. But I have to say I am incredibly proud of the steps that my, my son took to, to put a stop to this. Lynch was fired over those messages, but it was hardly the first time concerns were raised. The allegations that led to the criminal charges were initially investigated in the late 1990s, but nothing came of them. Instead, Lynch went on to coach in the United States and across Europe before returning to Canada. In Edson, Alberta, parents begged for an investigation into claims of verbal and physical abuse, as well as the coach's worrying relationship with a player, all now subject of an ongoing RCMP investigation. Lynch has previously told CBC News that he's shocked by the allegations and says they're part of a smear campaign. He's in police custody in Alberta and is expected to be moved to Regina later this week for his first court appearance. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says Justin Trudeau must fire his chief of staff, Katie Telford, if it's true. She didn't tell the prime minister that a complaint against his then chief of the defense staff was sexual in nature. Mr. Trudeau's team, the minister, uh, Ms. Telford, were aware of a direct allegation brought by a victim. And what was done with that? Nothing. In fact, it was covered up and kept from the prime minister, from what he tells us. The complaint was made in 2018 against Jonathan Vance, who retired this year and now faces public allegations. Trudeau has acknowledged he knew of the original complaint, but not that it was sexual. O'Toole says his party has put forward a motion that calls for Telford's dismissal to be debated in the House of Commons tomorrow. Well, for nine years, a Newfoundland man has been denied pension benefits as he sought to be recognized as the surviving same-sex husband of a CN Rail retiree. Ryan Cook shows us why the railway's rationale may finally be overturned. Jerry Schwartz was a company man until he retired in 1991. His 30 years at CN were topped only by 33 years spent with his partner, Ken Hare. All that suddenly changed when Schwartz died of heart failure in 2012, and Hare got a crushing letter of rejection from CN's pension department. I was suddenly went from being Jerry's common law spouse to being just a roommate. And the reason being... It, it, it was, he, they, they said, uh, their description at the time, their description of a couple was a man and a woman. Schwartz died in 2012, but he retired in 1991, meaning his pension was subject to 1991 rules, which did not yet recognize same-sex spouses. Ken Hare wasn't going to get a dollar. He had to sell their house and give up nearly everything in it, including their five dogs. I basically don't have anything left that we had when we, when we moved here to Newfoundland. And what do you think Jerry would think of you having to do that? Oh, it would have broke his heart. It would have broke his heart. It... Hare has spent part of the past nine years trying to fight. He's now hired a lawyer to take it to court. A leading expert in the field says he has a shot. I don't really think that CN has much of a defense, quite frankly. Doug Elliott won a case in 2007, allowing LGBT widows access to Canada Pension Plan benefits retroactive to 1985. 
He says Hare has a slam dunk in the court of law and the court of public opinion. CN is going to find themselves in a very bad odor with Canadians if they persist in this uh, bigoted stand that they're taking. And that's all it is. It's just pure bigotry. CN changed this policy in 1998 to include LGBT relationships, but it didn't make that change retroactive. Now, after nine years resisting, CN says it's reviewing that policy, admitting the old way doesn't meet its current standard for diversity or inclusion. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. It's been five years tonight since thousands were forced to flee one of Canada's worst wildfires. We both still have a little bit of PTSD issues. Just smelling a, a campfire, I, I, I can't be there. Next, the push for a second highway out of Fort McMurray before another evacuation. Not quite depression, not quite burnout. Languishing during the pandemic is a real thing. We asked the doctors how to shake the slump. And they lined up for hours for the return of a fast food favorite. We've been waiting for so, <laughs> so long for this. Yeah. <laughs> the secret recipe to Yellowknife's KFC connection. We're back in two. Bill and Melinda Gates, one of the world's wealthiest couples, have announced they are divorcing after 27 years of marriage. The couple posted a statement on Twitter today with the news. It says they will continue to work together at their foundation. Well, in the B.C. interior, landslides are threatening homes, washing out roads, prompting evacuation orders. And as Susanna De Silva reports, there are concerns that climate change could lead to seeing all of these things more often. See it? Everything all up in there is sliding. Down here is sliding. Rick Sutherland has been watching the roads in his area crumble. This was last Monday morning on one of them. This was Monday afternoon. It was the backup for the main highway connecting northern BC to the rest of the province. A highway also currently down to one lane because of a landslide. Our secondary road is sitting in the river now. You know, so now and there we have another road over here that sounds like it's going to wash out. What then? You know? We're all going to get boats. These washouts follow a year the province calls unprecedented, with 200 roads damaged in the vast Caribou region. We are getting very close to seeing the entire infrastructure network of this region collapse. They are vital for agriculture, for mining, for forestry, for small business. The largest forest fire in B.C. history happened here in 2017, further altering a landscape already feeling the effects of climate change, according to experts. And so going from essentially dry conditions down to very wet conditions, so flood to fire kind of situations and certainly it's a pattern again that we've seen in the last few years in northern British Columbia. This has all shifted, this has all dropped. Several homes in the city of Quinell have been placed on evacuation alert. Last year Katie Harrington's family was forced out of theirs. He said just leave everything, I just need you to get the kids in the car and leave the property. A year later and they are still out, denied house insurance and provincial disaster relief because landslides aren't covered. The province says it is pulling together experts to stabilize the current situation, saying it is spending tens of millions of dollars for repairs and replacements. But there is concern that what until now has been unprecedented could become the new normal. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Today marks the five-year anniversary of the monster wildfire that devastated Fort McMurray. Get out of town just in time. Get in the got to dodge. I can feel the heat here. Impossible to forget those pictures. Thousands fled as flames tore through the community in 2016. A chaotic evacuation that led to criticism of the response. After billions of dollars in damages, improvements have been made before the next wildfire comes. But as Jamie Melbuff shows us, a key issue remains. The forest on the other side was burnt. Duchess Sabovich still misses the forest that was once behind her home. The marsh that's left, a bitter reminder of her terrifying escape five years ago. Sobovich shot this video while fleeing Fort McMurray on the back of a motorcycle with her husband. They were stuck in a fiery gridlock for nine hours. We both still have a little bit of PTSD issues. 
The Horse River wildfire forced over 80,000 people to evacuate the community. More than 2,400 structures burned. 86% have been rebuilt, but many empty lots remain. We weren't even able to defend ourselves. Brian Fayant and other indigenous leaders say communication was a problem. We wanted to be informed so that we could help our members and our community, our elders, uh, whatever, escape, run from these fires. An independent report said if nothing changes, the province can expect something similar or worse to happen again. That was a very powerful fire and very difficult to work, a very difficult situation for everyone. But there were some important things that came out. There has been progress made on all 10 recommendations from the report, including fire forecasting starting earlier in the season. And that gives us more time to get people trained, more time to get people ready and positioned. And when a big fire does break out, the municipality, province and indigenous leaders are in the same room. But one glaring problem hasn't been resolved. There's still only one road in and out of Fort McMurray. A proposed second highway is being studied. That is something that I would like to see done. It's something that we advocated for strongly. But it would cost about $1.5 billion. When I look at provincial and federal budgets, that uh, there isn't a lot of money to spend on these things, but um, we just have to continue the advocacy. In the meantime, Fire Chief Jody Butts says evacuation plans have improved. We are much better than we were five years ago, and I can say that with 100% confidence. Sabovich, like many people here, would feel safer with a second road as she still struggles with what happened. My faith gets me through most things, even blessed with health and uh, our house keeps standing, I don't know. <laughs> and she's already planted new trees here, hoping there will be a forest for the next generation. Jamie Malbuff, CBC News, Fort McMurray. Well, does life during the pandemic have you feeling empty? It's called languishing, and it's taking a toll on people's mental health. We'll ask the doctors how to cope. Plus, you got a great attitude and you're, you're a strong boy. And a little boy with cancer gets a moment with his hockey hero and gives Sid the kid a special gift. Well, we are now 14 months into the pandemic in what's hopefully the final stretch. But the constant ups and downs, who among us isn't wearing thin, right? It's easy to feel a sense of stagnation, of, of emptiness as the weeks and months go by. It's called languishing. Psychologist Adam Grant recently wrote about it in the New York Times. So we turned to Instagram to ask what languishing looks like for you. One person compared it to climbing a never-ending ladder. Another, like listening to a song on repeat. And here's one many of us can relate to. Work, sleep, pay bills, repeat. So let's explore this and, and talk about how to break that cycle. Dr. Shimi Kang is a psychiatrist and author in Vancouver, and Dr. Raymond Abdurrahman is a clinical psychologist in Winnipeg. Hello to both of you. Hello. Hello. So, Dr. Kang, how do you see what languishing is at its core and why so many of us are feeling it these days? Yeah, so I'm going to just jump in and give what I think the science of that term means. Um, so acute stress is like crisis. That's adrenaline. And, you know, and that's when we go into freeze, fight, flight. We get anxious, irritable. We get distracted. And then long-term stress is cortisol. It's like this dullness. And it's think of an animal that's going into a cave. They're hiding. Uh, they don't have the vitality. And to me, that's languishing. I believe we've been there a long time, even pre-pandemic. The data on stress being the number one health epidemic has been there. Uh, and it is eroding our physical and mental health. And so I think languishing is a great word um, that we can all connect with and relate to. Uh, however, I think we were on that course even pre-pandemic, and it shined a, a lighter, uh, brighter light on it. Right. And I guess, Dr. Abdul Rahman, it, it, it's important to note that this affects everyone in, in different ways, right? And, and one of the common themes that I saw in the comments that we got was how it affects people's motivation and their drive, this, this feeling that, you know, our lives are almost just kind of chugging along at a low hum. If I, if I could read a few of these comments to you, I'm losing interest in everything because every day looks the same. I can't seem to find a sound routine. I have extra time, but no motivation, so I do nothing. How do you approach this question of, of energy and drive? 
You know, the interesting thing is uh, energy, drive, motivation are all tied to issues with mood. And typically, when we think about depression or dysthymia, we're not always looking at just sadness. We are looking at the wearing away of that energy and motivation. Now, the way that we tend to approach that needs to be tied to what we call behavioral activation. The problem that during a pandemic is that all things we would typically do that would increase that behavior, like a routine to go to work, being outside, socializing, a variety of activity, all of that is taken away. And so the way to approach that ultimately is to, in a situation where we've never been before, we have to become the people we never were before. And we have to start to think outside the box to find ways to do things that give us that activity, that variety, but it won't be the way that we're used to doing it. So give me an example. When you say thinking outside the box to do some of these things, what, what do you mean? Well, I am not an outdoor winters person at all. And, uh, you know, this past winter, I found myself getting all the winter equipment I needed to make sure that I was outside playing with my son. Uh, so I had to become somebody I wasn't in order to make sure that I had the activity and that variety that I needed that would sustain a good sense of mental health and positive mood. Dr. Kang, how do you see that, that fundamental problem of, of regaining or, or wrestling back control in your life? Yes, uh, I think it is. it definitely is a problem because we have to redefine and adaptability is the key to survival and thriving and adaptability is the best fit with an ever-changing world, that survival of the fittest. And so what we just heard is adaptation. We have to do things differently. Uh, and this science, though, is in all of us. We can all do it. The example you just heard is nature actually gives us motivation. We're meant to be outside. Connecting with loved ones gives us oxygen oxytocin, trying new things in terms of recreation. It's that word recreate that gives us serotonin. These are powerful mood enhancers, brain optimizers. We can do all of these activities uh, on our own. Uh, and even through the pandemic, uh, it's simple but not easy uh, is what I say. But if we really understand the science, um, sometimes we, there's a bit of numbness to the same uh, conversation, routine, regular sleep, get outside. Uh, but these are vital uh, and they are simple but not easy, but they lead to uh, wellness and vitality, which is what we're talking about. And, and Dr. Kang, is there a clear point at which a person should kind of look inward and say, you know what, maybe this is more than just a case of the blahs, right? That, that I'm just feeling like in this slump and that maybe I should think of my mental health and, and this idea of, of actually maybe I'm unwell right now. Yeah, so we would define, you know, when we cross over to a medical disorder of depression, uh, really uh, where it is now impacting your functioning. So, you know, you have this feeling of languishing, let's say, but you really are having a time being productive, uh, whether it is getting your work done, taking care of your kids, taking care of yourself. And I do want to mention burnout because burnout is in between depression and closer to languishing, I would say burnout is now recognized by the World Health Organization uh, as a syndrome. And I think we, we were headed to a lot of burnout uh, before pandemic. And of course, we're feeling it now. Uh, I like that word a bit better because I feel it's a bit more actionable. So Dr. Abdul Rahman, maybe, maybe I'll give you the last word here. Just in terms of, I mean, you mentioned some coping strategies, but what ought a person to do, I don't know, maybe starting tonight or tomorrow morning to feel like they're getting back on the right track, back to some sense of normalcy? Well, our emotions are tied to both our cognitions, or our thinking and our behavior. So look at your behavior. See what's changed uh, you know, from pre-pandemic. Uh, replicate the things that you need to do in a different way that gives you that activity and that variety as much as possible. Perspective also is critically important as well too. And the pandemic has kind of taken that away. We've got a moving target or a light at the end of the tunnel. So we have to work with ourselves and have conversations with people that allow us a shift in how we look at things. And that shift in the way that we look at things can offer that little bit of control that we often need. You know, it's the, the holding of a corner of a page instead of palming the entire page. And that little bit of control, that little bit of perception shift can allow us to turn page by page until we finish a book. One page at a time. I like that. Uh, doctors, thank you so much for your time. Helpful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, solid tips. The Chernobyl disaster is the subject of a new blockbuster movie in Russia. Next on The National, why survivors are upset with what they've seen on screen. 
And later, they lined up for hours in Yellowknife for the return of KFC. Why this is about a lot more than chicken. You know, Chernobyl is on fire. And every atom of uranium is like a bullet. Well, that was a scene from HBO's acclaimed 2019 miniseries Chernobyl, chronicling the world's worst nuclear disaster and attempted cover-up. It provoked considerable backlash in Russia. Many there condemned the show as biased and inaccurate. Now, less than a week after the 35th anniversary of the disaster, Russia has released its own cinematic take on the catastrophe. But as Chris Brown reports, for many, the film may only reawaken old trauma and unanswered questions. It's eerie to look at, and even more incredible to think that there was actually more than one nuclear plant like Chernobyl. In fact, there are nine such reactors, just like the one that blew up, still operating, including Ford, a nearly identical plant in Kurchatov, Russia. And so, when Russian movie producers decided to tell the story of the meltdown and the catastrophic explosion 35 years ago, they filmed it at Kurchatov's abandoned fifth reactor. Their movie version of the disaster has just opened across Russia with a lot of red carpet hype. A blockbuster for the big screen, it stars Russian heartthrob Danila Kozlovsky, who plays the lead role and directed the film. Of course, the American network HBO got there first with its critically acclaimed miniseries focusing on the lies and cover-up of the accident. But producer Alexander Rodnyansky told us Russians already know the so-called Soviet state machine was rotten. His story is about heroism. Our story tells about how the normal people, the hostages of this machine, uh, find themselves out in a position to stop the disaster. Many people who were part of the cleanup, the liquidators as they were called, got special screenings. Kozlovsky's character, a brave firefighter, was modeled on Nikolai Chebushev. Chabushev told us the movie was more fantasy than reality, without enough attention to all the lies people were told. Nina Soloshenkova is haunted too because she realizes that she was part of that cover-up. Her job was to preserve state secrets at Chernobyl. And that meant not telling anyone how bad the radiation contamination was. One of the most senior people on the ground was Nikolai Tarakanov, a Soviet general sent in to lead the cleanup. In the HBO movie, Tarakanov's character is shown assigning the liquidators to their deadly tasks. He finds it painful to talk about now. The things the Russian film omits enrage him. That sense of betrayal from Soviet authorities for taking shortcuts with safety, that Russia's government would later cut the liquidators' pensions, and the inescapable guilt he feels about sending so many people to their doom. Soviet 
он три раза выходил на крышу, их таких штук 10 человек было. На Чернобыльской атомной электростанции... It is, of course, a movie, not a documentary, but the Chernobyl survivors we talked to also said focusing just on heroism is a convenient way to escape accountability. Natalia Krulova works at the Kurchatov power plant. She was an extra during the filming. She believes a Russian movie about the lie has to be made. The legacy of Chernobyl remains intensely complicated and politically sensitive for Russia. That there were many heroes in the aftermath may be one of the few things everyone can agree on. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, next, long lines in Yellowknife to welcome back a fast food favorite. We've been waiting for so, <laughs> so long for this. Yeah. Why the return of KFC to the territory is kind of a big deal. Welcome back. There is concern in Yellowknife tonight. Schools are closed after a cluster of cases was detected, mostly in kids. But today, there was also a moment to celebrate as the city welcomed back a fast food staple that delivers more than just a hot meal. Chantal Zuburk was there for the grand opening of KFC. We've been waiting for so, <laughs> so long. long for this. Yeah. <laughs> Yellowknifers came in droves today in anticipation of the Colonel's return six years in the making. As the city scrambles to deal with its first major COVID outbreak, a masked and distance line formed ahead of opening with some waiting as long as three hours in their cars. I'm gonna grab for my daughter. She's in Wekwiti. I'm gonna get a bucket for her. So, been waiting a few years already, so. <laughs> What's a few more hours? <laughs> I think I'm gonna get the popcorn chicken, honestly. Many people across the Northwest Territories have a long relationship and love for KFC. In 1968, it became the first fast food chain in Yellowknife, one of the top 10 most profitable in the country. Once a staple at community gatherings, weddings and graduations across the territory. This aircraft behind me is a Douglas DC-3. LFR has been in Yellowknife since the 80s. It's literally flown tens of thousands of pieces of KFC chicken to communities all over the north. Mikey McBrien says when the family-run KFC closed in 2015, people felt a loss. So losing KFC sounds very weird, but it really made Yellowknife a less of a city and more of a, a small town. I think it was really disappointing when it closed because it was a real meeting place for people. Some went to extremes to get their fix, like this woman who would drive to Alberta for the Colonel's special recipe. I would bring back a big pile of it, um, at one time, I had probably like 10 to 12, 13 buckets of chicken bringing it back with me. <laughs> with pandemic fears heightened, the grand opening was smaller than planned, but when doors finally opened, the community celebrated. <laughs> and with packed lineups all day, <laughs> it appears the relationship is picking up where it left off. Chantal Zbuk, CBC News, Yellowknife. They're so excited. Up next, that feeling when dreams do come true. How a young kid in Winnipeg got his shot at meeting his hockey idol. Eleven-year-old Dion Green loves hockey, and his favorite player, well, you can see from that poster there, Sidney Crosby, of course, Dion owns all the requisite Pittsburgh Penguins gear from the jersey down to a pair of PJs. So now Dion is battling cancer for the third time, but he had a banner day recently when a charity that delivers dreams delivered number 87. And that's our moment. Mind blowing. <laughs> He's like mind blowing. I don't even know what to say. His wish still always remained the same throughout these years, and it was always to meet Sidney Crosby. At the time, Dean was battling acute lymphoblastic leukemia, 
his second time having cancer. He was six years old at the time. Dream Factory here in Winnipeg contacted me and emailed me and told me that they were working on something. Sidney Crosby, his attention was on his, his medallion. Oh, nice. I think that's where it sparked his, his little idea, you know, to send Crosby the exact same medallion. Now it's just an extra bonus that his hockey idol has the same medallion as him. Well, that is too cool. Uh, and Sidney Crosby was, was pretty generous with his time. Apparently gave him a full, like a half hour tour on ice, showed him around, showed him the change rooms, even introduced him to another player with the Penguins. That's, Amazing. that's awesome. And Dion, we hear that your middle name is Sydney. <laughs> right. How great yeah. is that? And I know that you've been wearing that medallion since that meeting on April 14th. Hang on to it. We're thinking the best for you. Mm. That is a national for May the 3rd. Good night. Good night.